So you all may not realize it, but water is actually invisible. It's hidden in this room all around us. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If you take 683 gallons of water, you can count them, that's actually 683, <laughs> that would allow you to grow six pounds of alfalfa hay. Now, if you take those six pounds of alfalfa hay and you put them into a machine that looks like that, it will give you one gallon of milk. So inside that one little gallon of milk, you have almost 700 gallons of water. And it's not just milk. One grape, not a bunch of grapes, one grape represents about a third of a gallon. A single walnut, about five. One potato, almost seven. A cup of coffee, not a venti latte at Starbucks, <laughs> just a cup of coffee, almost 40 gallons of water. Now, if it were a latte, it would be a lot worse, because as I just told you about dairy, that's a lot of water. One Greek yogurt, 90 gallons of water. And the real culprit here is meat. A single hamburger, over 600 gallons of water. But it's not just food. It takes water to make things. To make steel, you need water. One pound of steel, which is not a lot of steel, takes about 11 gallons of water. Same goes for all the raw materials we use, plastic, cement, cotton, paper, you name it, they all take water to make. What that means is the clothes that you're wearing, the phone that's in your pocket, the car you drove to get here, all represent enormous amounts of water. So it takes water to do everything that we do. Now, the good news is we have a lot of water on Earth. The bad news is that almost all of it is in our oceans. 97% of the water on Earth is in the oceans. And that water's not too useful to us, because, as you all know, that's salty. So there's 3% water left. How's that distributed? So there's water that we see in the rain and snow that goes through the water cycle, comes down in rivers and lakes. We would call that renewable runoff. Looks like a lot of water, but it's not. Some of that water percolates down through the ground and forms aquifers or groundwater. And we can tap those with a well and pull that up and use that water to do all these things. Now, I put renewable in quotes here because it's only renewable if you're extracting that water at a slower rate than it's being naturally replenished. And let me tell you, most of the water, the groundwater that we're tapping, is not being used in that way. Now, there's other water in the ground that is sometimes called fossil water. These are aquifers that have been down there for so long, you think of them like fossil fuels, coal and oil, those things that have been down there for millions of years, because they're not really being replenished at all. And we're tapping those too. To give you an example, the country of Libya built something called the Great Man-Made River that funnels fossil water under the Sahara for their use. And they spent $32 billion on the Great Man-Made River, and it's projected to only last for about 20 years. So how is this fresh water distributed, this 3%? Well, only about 0.3% of that 3% is in that water we see in the lakes and rivers. About 30% of it is down there under the ground in that groundwater. And you guys can do the math. That doesn't total up to 100. Where's the rest of it? It's locked up in places where we can't get at it, in permafrost and glaciers and things like that. So we've got a very small supply of fresh water that we're using to do all these important things, and we're not using it sustainably. The situation's even worse than that, though. We have a changing climate. And one of the effects of a changing climate is that glaciers are melting all over the Earth. You might think, who cares? But the annual meltwater off those glaciers, for example, in the Tibetan Plateau in the Himalayan mountains, that is the source of most of the major river systems that run through Asia, which is the source of water for over one and a half billion people on Earth, soon to be two billion. So as those glaciers go away, those rivers diminish and eventually go away. Where will all those people get their water? I don't know. Another big impact of climate change on our water is droughts. We all are familiar with the drought that's going on on the West Coast these days. The drought that's in the Middle East is the worst in 900 years, thanks to climate change. That has led to food shortages in the Middle East, which was one of the major contributing factors to the Arab Spring and the, the conflict that's in Syria right now. So, We've got huge threats to our water supply. What about the demand? What's happening to water demand? Well, by the year 2050, 35 years from now roughly, 
that's projected to rise 55%. So we have a shrinking supply, skyrocketing demand of the most important material on Earth. What does that mean? It means that just like oil conflicts shaped our geopolitical order in the last century, it's going to be water conflicts which are going to shape the century we live in today. But this isn't just about the future. There are water crises happening on Earth right now. Every 90 seconds, somewhere on Earth, a child dies from a water-related disease. In just the few short minutes I'm standing on this stage, seven more children will have died for this reason. Children in places like India and large parts of Africa, especially girls, are trapped by water. What I mean by that is they don't have a source of water in their homes for all their daily needs, drinking, cooking, laundry, bathing, whatever they need their water for. They have to walk and go get all the water their family needs every day. And often the distance they have to walk is well over a mile. So they spend hours, literally hours, every day walking, carrying very heavy water, back to their home, usually several trips. What that means is that those girls don't get to go to school, which means they never enter the workforce like their male siblings and participate in the global economy the way the rest of us can. There's no reason for this to be happening in 2016. Now, there is more good news about water. You can't use up water. The water that we have on Earth has been here since long before there was life on Earth, and it's not going anywhere. It just keeps going through a cycle. What that means is that when you drink a glass of water, every molecule of that water, at some point in its life, has been inside an oak tree, it's been blasted out by a volcano, and it's been urinated by a dinosaur. <laughs> Sounds gross. But actually, this teaches you something else that's good news about water. It doesn't matter how dirty you make water, what you put in there, you can always clean it again. You can always get back to water that you can drink. Now, there's all kinds of new innovations to take advantage of that fact about water. One is that, what does clean water really mean? So you need a certain level of cleanliness of water to drink it, but maybe you don't need that same cleanliness of water to flush your toilet or water your lawn. And so, there's this idea that they call fit for use, using the right water for the right purpose. Interestingly enough, the ancient Romans actually did this. They had different streams of water for different purposes, in the public fountains and the baths, for example. And just now today, a long time later, we're getting back to that idea. Desalination. I mentioned that 97% of the water on Earth is in our oceans. We know how to take that salt water and turn it into fresh water. That process is called desalination, and there are all kinds of innovation in that space, making it more energy efficient. Membranes are one of the great ways to clean water. This is basically a barrier that you can squeeze dirty water through, and all that comes out on the backside is clean water, and all the stuff gets trapped by the membrane. You might have one of these under your sink. The problem with these membrane technologies is that those membranes get dirty, inevitably, and that is a huge cost to replace those things and clean them all the time. Places like Argonne National Lab, where I work, and other places, we're developing membranes that actually clean themselves so that they rarely, if ever, have to be replaced. Now, those are about ways to clean water. We can also just use the water that we have more efficiently. And where most of our water goes, as I alluded to earlier, is in agriculture, growing the food that, that we all eat or that we feed to our animals that we then eat. And so using that water more efficiently can have a huge impact, and this would be called precision agriculture, where you're delivering just the right amount of water to the right plant at the right time. That will have huge savings. There are also things you can do in your own home that can make a real difference. Outside your home, you can use landscaping that is native to the region in which you live, so it doesn't need to be watered much, if at all. You can install low-flow faucets, dual flush toilets. Toilets are where a huge amount of water is wasted. In the United States alone, we flush almost six billion gallons of fresh drinking water down the toilet every day. Here's a way you can save on that. So, I mentioned at the beginning that water is invisible. What I'd encourage all of you to do is to start seeing water. See it in the food that you eat, see it in the things on you and around you. And if we can all start doing that, we can start more sustainably using the most important material on Earth. Thank you.